There are fewer than 30 men in the world qualified to drive Formula One. A mere half dozen, perhaps, to win. At this moment, I'm inclined to think you're not one of them. Welcome to F1Weekly.com. My name is Clark Rogers. I'm the host of the program. I'll be joined by Nasser Hamid, my co-host. This is podcast number 1033, February 26th, 2024, Nasser. Thank you, sir. I say greetings and racing regards from Ronnie Peterson's hometown of Urebru. Preseason testing is over, more of the same. Max has the pace. Competition has Denny's three egg omelette on the face. Back to Palatial Studios. Thank you, Nasser. On today's program, Formula One is back in town. Fernando, he says 19 drivers already know. They're not going to win the championship. Ferrari, look very fast, very clean. Great, great look. I think they're the ones to beat this year. LCH already looks a bit awkward at Mercedes, and we'll see how that transpires if the car is at all competitive with the top two. And ladies and gentlemen, this week's interview from Sweden, direct Ronnie Peterson's brother, Tommy Peterson, and Nass will have all the complicated details around this great interview. And I just want to remind everybody that, yes, we do need your contributions to keep this program up on the servers. Just click on the Support F1 Weekly tab. You know you want to. Nass, welcome to the studio. How are you? I am doing very good, sir. I was expecting a lot of snow and a lot of cold in Sweden. But that is not the case, so which is good. But very pleased to say this is a very important and historical podcast for F1 Weekly. This small town, Urebru in Sweden, produced a very big talent in the world of Formula One, Ronnie Peterson. Back in 1973, when I started following Formula One, Mr. Rogers, Ronnie was one of the fastest drivers and definitely most exciting to watch slipping and sliding at over 100 miles per hour on fast tracks like Silverstone, Oosterreichring, and Monza. And most of the photos you see are him either slipping and sliding in a STP March or a JPS Lotus, so that was always a beauty. I came here to meet his younger brother, Tommy, and the origin of this meeting is in Denmark. Nothing fishy here, but a gentleman by the name of Fleming Jensen has a Facebook page on Ronnie, and Fleming lives in Copenhagen. He put me in touch with his friend, Anders Hulquist, who has known Tommy for a long time, and he was kind enough to pick me up from Urebru Central train station on Saturday. And Mr. Rogers, we went straight to a restaurant called Monza for lunch with Tommy, and on the wall there's a full-size photo finish of the uh, 1971 Italian Grand Prix. Now this is my favorite track and this is my all-time favorite race where I think five cars finished within a second or two of each other and Ronnie was second to Peter Gethin by a few inches. And interestingly there is a Ronnie Peterson pizza on the menu. They also have a very nice photo album of Ronnie's career and that was how we spent our day on Saturday. Then on Sunday we met again for lunch after that, we went to the Almby Cemetery, where Ronnie is laid to rest alongside his wife and parents. His wife, Barbara, was also from the same town, Urebru. Then we went to Tommy's house, where Ronnie also lived for a short time before his racing career took off and he moved to England. Uh, Tommy showed me the garage where his first Formula 3 cars were built by his dad and a family friend. So there's a lot of history here. He has a very nice collection of books. He showed me a book which Fangio had signed for Ronnie, and there was also a signed autograph book 
a book called Much Pond Express, which is very well known, uh, written by Sam Posey. It was very nice to see photographs of Ronnie's life from childhood to karting, and I took some pictures uh, from his photo album, uh, racing in the streets of Villarreal in Portugal and Monte Carlo and going all the way up to Formula One. I am very thankful to Tommy for his time and sharing racing memories. His friend Anders used to race himself and was Camaro Cup champion in Sweden twice. He showed me and started his McLaren GT car, which is a very impressive machine and has a very impressive sound also. Also, many thanks to Fleming, uh, who made this possible. Please check his Ronnie Peterson page on Facebook. And with a little Swedish Rhapsody, we come to conversation with Tommy Peterson. Please enjoy an important part of Formula One history. Okay, folks, I'm here in Urebru with Tommy Peterson, brother of Ronnie Peterson. Sir, very nice to meet you. How are you today? I'm sorry. Uh, we are sitting in the house, you and Ronnie, uh, spent some time together. I understand his racing adventure started by racing around the family home on bicycles with friends. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your early days with him? You start for it in my mother's farm, and they have a farmer. So they have a big area, and our father built a, a, a small tractor. So we start running with that. Yeah, with, with a motorcycle engine. Yes. Now, your dad was involved in ice racing. Did you and Ronnie go to a lot of his races? No, he, he's, he finished uh, racing 49. So I was just three years that time, so... Okay, the first, and you can translate for him, it's not a problem. Yeah, no. uh, the first competition car for you and Ronnie was the soapbox car your dad helped build. How much time did you get to drive it compared to Ronnie? Like a go kart? Uh, th- th- that's what we call tractor. Tractor, that's what you yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, that's... Did you get much time to drive it or was it mostly Ronnie? It was mostly Ronnie. Okay. <laughs> Ronnie was, uh, three, he was two, three years uh, older, you know. Okay, in the, this is very interesting. In the book, Memories of Ronnie Peterson, there is an interesting story of Ronnie getting tickets on his moped. Will you please give a little background on this? And you can trust uh, me. Not only once. <laughs> was, How many times? I don't know. It's uh, four or five times. <laughs> okay. Was he always very quick from the beginning? Yeah, I think so. How old was Ronnie when you and your family realized we have a special talent who could go all the way? I think it was bef- a little bit before he started to drive go coach. So, t- so uh, he already when he got the uh, uh, moped uh, times and he fixed them to go faster and everything. So he loved it. And I think as well uh, the tractor, when, yeah. he, when he was driving the tractor, it, it looked like a, uh, we have some pictures. I have I seen it in the book. Yeah. In, yeah, yeah. So it looked like a small tractor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Now, was your mom supportive of Ronnie going racing? Yes, she was always with him in the beginning, even my father, of course. Uh, you were his mechanic in his karting days. Did he request a lot of adjustment or were... Just went fast, whatever you gave, you did for him. Yeah, sometime when my father did not have time for it. For the most time, it was my father together with him. In 1963 and 64, Ronnie won the Swedish Karting Championship. Can you please share some memories from those two seasons? Any particular race or special memory you may have? No, not exactly from 62... Uh, 64. I remember 66 when uh, I was together with him in World Championship in Copenhagen. And we have a lot of problems because uh, he, uh, they drive faster than him on the straight. So we changed uh, uh, engines all the time and they still was quicker on the straight. And after we coming home, we no, the problem was the carburetor, and we changed 
the engines, but the same carburetor on everyone. <laughs> One of uh, Ronnie's rivals in the European Championship was a girl by the name of Susanna Raganelli. Did you know her, and how good and quick was she? She was good, and he, and she was uh, not uh, was Emma Weger. Uh, she, was she was light, um, so it okay, was quite quick so of that. So <laughs> okay. uh, Ronnie got his racing license from René Vassell at Karlskoga, driving your dad's Mercedes diesel. Uh, did you go with him, and how excited was he on getting this racing license? Yeah, I think I was there, but I don't remember so well. Okay, no problem. In Formula 3, at the first race at Gelerasen, the roll bar was not approved and the family team had to return home and rebuild the roll bar. Can you tell us about the background of this car, please, and what happened in the race? It was the, the first race with the Brabham. He had run earlier with the Swebe. And uh, he bought uh, Kurt Aron's bar- Brabham and come to Kaskoga for a race. The roll bar was too low, so it was uh, not to going on. Uh, what hit it? The seating. Scrutineering. Scrutineering was saying, you know, start with that. So we went home to our brew and make a, a new, one. new one for a little bit higher. And after that, uh, on the race on Sunday, he turned off, cr- uh, turn off uh, Flipped over. so got up Upside down, and the roll bar save him. So good that you changed that. Yep. Okay, <clears throat> racing has always been very expensive. When Ronnie started racing in Formula Three in Europe, who were the people or companies supporting his racing career? From the beginning, it was only himself and my mother and father. And uh, '68, he got some small sponsors, so. Smog come in 69, yeah. and that was a big sponsor. In 1969, he won the European Formula 3 Championship. How important was winning the Monaco F3 race after a great battle with Wissel, who was his instructor, who gave him the license for his career? I think it was uh, quite, because it got a uh, lot of... Uh, offering. Offering after that. I think uh, some team... Got to the saw the talent. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I, I remember it when we was on Silverstone '69, and at the race there, I saw I was standing in the paddock, and Conor Chapman come through and look on the Formula Three race. He, I don't know how, how often he do that, yeah. but that time he did it, looking after. It. His Formula 1 debut came in 1970, Monaco Grand Prix. Uh, do you remember his feelings about being in the big league and driving a Formula machinery? No, I can't answer that because I wasn't there. So. Okay. Now, his second race was at Spa before he got to the track. Your brother got in some trouble with traffic police. Will you please tell our story uh, to our listeners and if you were there on that day? Yeah, I heard about it, but I don't know anything about it. Did you ever ask your brother about it? Well, no, not to. His first championship points came by finishing second in the third race, Monaco uh, Grand Prix 71. Uh, what was his reaction when you met him after the race? Scoring a point was in those days only top six, so must have been a big day for him. Yeah. Oh, in Monaco, in, yes. In Monaco. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, same year with March, he won the Formula 2 championship and was second in the great last lap battle at Monza in Formula 1. You know, picture where we had the lunch yesterday. Uh, were you at that race in 71? Not that race. No. Did you? Uh, how many of his Formula 1 races did you go to? I think uh, 22, 23 or something like that. Now, the first Swedish Grand Prix uh, at Enderstop, 73... This was going to be a great win for your brother, but then there was a late race uh, puncture. I'm sure you were there. How upset was Ronnie after the race? Uh, not upset. Uh, he was uh, a little bit angry on it, but uh, second was not bad either. But he would have done the first win on home track. 
I'm sure there was, if being the first ever Formula One race in Sweden, I'm sure there was a huge crowd. What was the reaction of the crowd, if you remember? They, uh, the crowd was disappointed on some time. It was wild. And they go wild. His first Formula One victory, which I remember very well, came in the next race at Paul Rica, French Grand Prix. Must have been a great day f- for him and your family. Were you at that race? No, I wasn't. Do you remember anything him saying to you after the race? No, I don't home? remember that. I was only w- with him with for one win, and that was uh, 74 in uh, Monaco. I was. Okay, and he had 10 wins. Uh, was there a particular victory apart from being at Monza, which, uh, Monaco, which I'm sure was a great feeling for you? Are there any other races that your brother did in Formula One that you have very good memories of? No, not especially. This was, no, I don't think so. Um, he had a manager by the name of Stefan Svenby. When did Ronnie hire him to help him in his career? Uh, start uh, seven, after 71, I think, 72, maybe. And was he also from this Orebru area? No, he was living in Malmö. Uh, Ronnie raced and won against some great drivers like Jackie Stewart, Nicky Lauda, Emerson Fittipaldi, Mario Andretti. These last two were teammates at Lotus. Uh, did he ever talk to you about who his biggest rivals were on the track or drivers he thought were very good? No, he's never talking about that. But I know he was a very good friend of Tim Schenken from sixty. Nine, sixty-eight, sixty-nine. I think we uh, we met the team first time, and they become very good friends. And uh, on the Lotus, uh, Emerson was a good friend, and Nicolaudo was a good friend. I think it's no problem with anyone. Now, during his racing years, he was based mostly in England, and on one of your visits to his apartments, you slept on the couch and someone who would go on to win three world championships slept on the kitchen floor. Tell us the story here. Yeah, we was uh, in the beginning, uh, I think uh, Ronnie lived, rent a room with, uh, at March secretary's home. And we, when I was over there, and a lot of people coming in, all one, they was going to sleep over there too. So... I was sleeping in this big room and sofa, and some guys sleeping on the floor. And who was that guy? I think uh, Nicolauda was there too, and sleep on the floor in kitchen. So, and and uh, you mentioned Andre Pascarella also slept on the floor. Yes, uh, it was before they said uh, they're traveling together, Ronnie and Pescarola over to to Watkins Glen for the sport car race and Ronnie was winning there for Alfa Romeo and Okay, now you know some years ago I believe you were involved in putting together a very nice Ronnie Peterson museum uh, which I understand is now closed uh, Where are all the cars and artifacts gone now? We only uh, borrowed the cars um, from people who owns that so they got back to them they uh, borrow it uh, to a uh, little bit after yeah. from Hornina. <clears throat> Nina has all the trophies. Okay, so, so do they have anything in the museum in the south? We don't know if there's no grey car in Simresan. I don't know. Last year I was talking to Jochen Nirbash, who was head of BMW Motorsports, when Ronnie drove for them, and he said to me that Ronnie was the best driver, which a lot of people say. Mario Andretti called Ronnie his best teammate. Your brother has left great memories for a lot of fans around the world. Uh, would you have a message for our listeners? Um, we have listeners all over the world. It's uh, Of course, it's uh, great to so many remember him. That's, that's nice. I can only say that. No, no the people have very good memories, so do I, and I watch a lot of stuff on the web, and it's very nice to see how nicely he is remembered. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I greatly appreciate this. Tommy, thanks for joining F1Weekly.com. Nasser? Yes, sir. And today is Monday. I am flying out on Wednesday, flying to Berlin. 
And I'm going to meet with Mr. Paul Velasco of Grand Prix247.com. And our plan is to go to our circuit. Now, the beauty is he wrote to me that a major transportation strike starts in Germany on Thursday. I mean, I don't know if it's all of Germany or at least for sure in Berlin. So I'm missing that by, uh, by a day. But we'll, we'll try to do what we can with resources available. Okay, sir, have you, I am sure you have been following preseason testing. Of course, sir. It's so exciting. It, it was just too much. Did you watch some of the action? I did watch some of the action. A lot of it is not available to the little people, but uh, I went to F1.com and everywhere else to grab as much information as possible. And let's not forget, ladies and gentlemen, this is a continuation of 2023 even though i know they've rebuilt the cars replaced everything we got new suspension updates on many of the cars we're still in the 2022 regulation so there wasn't too many surprises except that i thought ferrari really was the most competitive with red bull well the three-day test session in bahrain where the season opening race is happening this weekend and Mr. Rogers, you and I don't agree on a lot of things, except Alonso is machismo and not much else. But I think on this issue, you will agree with me that once the off season is off and we get into the rhythm of preseason testing and cars are moving around fast, tires are squealing, it's a beautiful world right there and then. Do you concur? I do concur. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. But like you said already on the podcast at the beginning, the whole uh, preseason testing can be summed up by the man of much wisdom and two championships. Machismo has spoken, and who can argue with him? And he has said 19 drivers already know uh, they will not win the championship. But the question I have is this, and you probably know the answer. He did not keep text messages from Pedro de la Rosa secret. Why not tell us who the lucky one is? Who can it be now, Mr. Rogers? Who can it be now? Well, you know, Max. And and let's not forget, okay, Max and the and the and the development on the car. A lot of people were surprised that Red Bull went on the limb and really redesigned a lot of this car in certain areas. But I have a funny feeling that even though they looked fantastic, they were actually sandbagging. And on the first race, everybody will know. That Max is 2024 world champion. Yeah, no, no, no question on that. I think there will be two teams down in the boondocks and they will not surprise anyone. I'll be surprised if they surprised anyone even in the second half of the season. Haas F1 and the team with the Le Eternal L plan, Alpine. At least one positive note here. Kevin Magnussen of Haas F1 did the most laps of any driver, 239, and that is 1,293 kilometers or 803 miles. That is 300 more miles than 200 laps of the brickyard. His teammate was playing ball also. He logged in 202, 202 laps for Nico Hulkenberg, and he was number five on the long haul register. Now, unfortunately, pace for the team with HQ in North Carolina, operating from a base in England with engines from Maranello, has not been impressive. And nice to know that their ex-team leader will be a pundit on German network RTL for seven races. But that's another story. New team principal Komatsu-san has not brought in six-tenths to the team like you-know-who. Do you see any progress for this team, sir? None whatsoever. I feel terrible. But once again, I mean, maybe their Ferrari motor is going to be updated with this year's Ferrari. They might have a little bit more pace from that. But really, let's get Andretti in here and let's let Haas stick with NASCAR. They should stick to avocados, I think. That's a good idea. I love avocados de Mexico. Yes. Okay, you know, um, first it was said that uh, Gene Haas called uh, Gunter Steiner and said, I will not renew the contract, and that was the end of the conversation. Now reports have come out, you probably have seen it, that according to Gunter Steiner, uh, he was going to bring on board a $20 million sponsor, but 
he tried to do a Brad Keselowski on Gene Haas by saying, I bring this money and you give me share in their team. This is what Brad Keselowski wanted Roger Penske to do. And Gene Haas gave him a Ray Charles CD, Hit the Road Jack. So I don't know which version is true, but this is now making the round on the interweb. Okay, sir, moving on to your fully French team, Alpine. Not showing much pace and surprise, surprise. This really was a joke to me. There is already talk of more heads rolling. I wish the team and Renault CEO, Luca Di Meo, all the best. Now, this is what they have done in the last few years. They have brought in and blown out MotoGP team principal to run an F1 team. Wholesale chop-chop going on from Alain Permain to Alain Prost. All I can say is, the road to hell and out of Formula 1 is paved with good intentions. Now, do you see any hope for your beloved Renault-owned team? I don't, and I'm very disappointed because this is the team that brought me to Formula 1 many, 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 many moons ago. But you know what? Ever since Carlos Goshen escaped in a piano, this team has not done very well. So I'm not sure. Maybe they should give him a call in Beirut. Yes, and maybe he can sh ship them this time in a cello case, and maybe he can write a new piece, you know. Thank you, Nasser. But wait, there's more. Misery loves company. If several media reports are to be believed, Audi is having buyer's remorse. They are paying a substantial amount to Sauber to increase their shareholding every year till they take full control in 2026. And taking off full control, you know, the Finn Rousing family, uh, which has their fortune from Tetra Pak packaging, they are from Sweden also. Okay, now based on some high-level management changes, rumor mill is spinning out a new thread. Audi wants out. I will believe this if and when it happens. Audi has basically pulled out of all motorsports activities to concentrate on their first ever foray into Formula One, which is the first and the right step to do. They have hired Andreas Seidel from McLaren and Carlos Sainz Jr. is strongly reported, has been for many months, uh, before being given the pink slip at the red team, that he will be their top choice. Their sister company, Porsche, both Audi and Porsche are part of VW Automotive Reich, already played hardball with Red Bull and had to leave the arena. Let's hope rumors of Audi departing before arriving remain rumors. But this is Formula One, folks. Expect the unexpected like Alonso and John Dennis reunited and feeling not so good with GP2 engine. Why is it that Alonso comes in any conversation, Mr. Rogers? Because he's so full of wisdom and he's sort of a funny guy now. I mean, his some of his jokes are hilarious and he's beginning to become similar to our favorite old baseball player when he said... It's deja vu all over again. So we had Yogi Berra. Now we have Fernando and Machismo. Yeah, Alonso is something. His all-time favorite comment for me was karma, especially in context to him saying regarding uh, not Lewis Hamilton or Sebastian Vettel, but Julian Palmer. Oh, my God. There is a guy who does a, you know, a lot of people loading vlogs, whatever they are called, on video stuff. And every time he refers to Julian Palmer, he inserts his uh, middle name with the F word. So, you know, that karma was beautiful. Okay, sir, now let's look at some positive possibility from negativity. The way things are going, Michael Andretti may soon have a choice from three low-hanging sour grapes to make some Nancy Sinatra vintage summer wine. According to David Byrne, there is water at the bottom of the ocean. And I say you may find yourself drowning in your own sorrow. So let's go to the top of the ocean and see who is making the waves. Ferrari has posted some fast times and other teams seem to be catching up also, catching up to the second best team that is. And the verdict is out on that one, at this stage at least. But let's not fool ourselves. Three-time world champion Max Verstappen has declared his 2024 car is better than his 2023 ride. So, all he has to do now is go one race better 
to have a clean sweep of the competition. Immaculate season in Formula 1, very difficult, especially with the ever-increasing number of races every year. But I am sticking to my story. Max will win five championships in a row when Honda says sayonara to Red Bull and are leaving on the midnight train to Lawrence Station. Adrian Newey may be on that gravy train also. And we have not even discussed or brought in the issue that's going on with their team leader, Mr. Christian Horner. Then the time will come for Max Verstappen to wear the right shoe of Lewis Hamilton from the 2022 season and the left shoe of Fernando Alonso. Here he comes again from any of the seasons from 2014. I just hope we can see a few very positive things in 2024, which I think will be good for the sport. First, Sergio Perez putting up a good fight. Now nobody in his right mind is expecting him to beat his teammate to the championship. But at the same time, we don't want to see Checo suffer from another season of being Max Espinata and also Media Espinata. You know, uh, Mr. Uh, Ricciardo, Daniel Ricciardo, is waiting for him to stumble and fall and he'll grab his seat. A victory in his off design season with Mercedes will be very good for LCH and his soon-to-be ex-BFF Toto. Then we have the happy chappies at McLaren. Oscar has already taken a sprint race victory and it will be great to see him win a Formula 1 Grand Prix. And same for his teammate Lando Norris who has started from pole position, almost won in Russia but lost out in the Russian rainy roulette. Machismo wants to be at Mercedes. What a story it will be if he gives Aston Martin their first ever Grand Prix victory in Formula 1 before saying adios to Mucho Dolores Senior Stroll. Now I say leaving the team with only one talented driver is not going to be very good, but Machismo has to look out for numero uno. Now in the pipe dream portfolio, we would love to see a podium for Nico Hulkenberg Logan Sargent going on a beat to finish ahead of his teammate Alex Elborn in the championship. Any of these things happening in your esteemed opinion, Mr. Rogers? Well, it's very interesting. So Wolf has been seen with Briatore, but Briatore is always hanging out with these kind of people. That's So that's not necessarily big news, but Fernando is in a good position to negotiate. And Toto wants to match the excitement of LCH going to Ferrari because that's, he gets jealous pretty quickly if Ferrari sort of gets the upper hand. So Toto choosing Fernando could be the big news that puts him right up there with Frédéric Vasseur in a coup of getting Fernando in the Mercedes because we know Fernando in the Mercedes and LCH in the Ferrari is entertainment in our dreams. I think it will top the Hamilton to Ferrari news just because Alonso is going to Mercedes. And not only that, he's not taking George Russell's place. He's taking his ex-teammate's seat. And he knows how good the ex-teammate is. Let's not forget that, Mr. Rogers. I, I, I can't recall... Well, you speak Spanish, so next time you uh, uh, meet Fernando Alonso, ask him, you know, que paso muy bueno, amigo Hamilton, and he will tell you. Let me tell you what he said, which was really very, very impressive. This is when Sebastian Vettel was winning races after races and championships after championships at Red Bull. And your man Alonso Machismo made a comment that Seb has still long ways to go before he can be on the level of Lewis Carl Hamilton. So, gracias muchachas to Alonso. So, sir, are you ready for round one? It's going to be exciting. I really believe that Leclerc, you know, he's going to be the pole meister again because they've given him a very good car that's apparently easier to drive and it responds to input well. So, it's going to be fascinating. But like I said, I think Red Bull was sandbagging and they're going to look unbelievable when we arrive back in Bahrain. Yes, according to Mr. Frederick Vasseur, they are on a different planet, reference to not the whole package, but tire degradation, which was their big issue. I mean, they could pump in a fast time on a one-lapper, which uh, Leclerc has made his specialty, 
but they were also suffering from the same problem as uh, massive tire degradation during the race as Haas, and they're also using Ferrari engine. But I don't think uh, the tire degradation has something to do with uh, the engine. It will be very good if the field is competitive, uh, but it really has to be who's going to be number two, who's going to be number one behind Max Verstappen. Whether it will be Ferrari or Mercedes, I think we're going to find, find out after the first few rounds. I think you're absolutely right. According to the math that everybody's done, they pulled out their slide rule from their pocket protectors, and apparently Max will have two-tenths a lap. Now, if you do the math, two-tenths a lap, and we got 24 races... He's going to be so far ahead, folks. It's going to be ridiculous. So once again, a positive attitude would be just make two, number one, make three, number two, make four, number three, and that'll cheer up the crowd. Even Lando Norris, who was hoping to take it to Max, knows and is realistic that his chances are if Max gets sick with a bad lumpia or something. So why don't we take a quick break? Think about all this, and we'll be back after these brief messages. Hello, Clark. Hello, Nasser. Hello, listeners. Well, I'm here back again to do my spotlight on Lewis Hamilton, the newest driver that has been confirmed for Vodafone McLaren Mercedes. He'll be making his debut in Australia. He's 21 years old, and he'll be alongside world champion Fernando Alonso with Pedro de la Rosa and Gary Paffett continuing as test drivers. Now, we might know a little bit about this youngster. He's a 2006 GP2 champion who also dominated the 2005 F3 Euro Series in a Dallara Mercedes. He won 15 out of 20 races there, and he's already started testing for Vodafone McLaren Mercedes. It was at the age of 13 that little Lewis Hamilton was first approached by Ron Dennis at an awards dinner who informed him that he wanted young Lewis to race for his team. Taken by Hamilton's enthusiasm... The youngster was inducted into the McLaren and Mercedes-Benz Young Driver Support Program, which he was there from its inception in 1998. It's a nice story, smiled Hamilton when he was talking about this. He said, I've been with the team for nine years now, and I'm only 21. Loyalty has been the key. This is the end of one chapter of my life and the start of another. So that made me think, well, where did his chapter, the chapter of his life start? Well, a little bit of background about the lad. His name is Lewis Carl Hamilton. He's born January 7th, 1986. I think I got married the first time that year. Wow, he was born. Um, His place of birth was Stevenage or Stevenage in the UK. He currently lives in Tewinwood. (laughs) Tewin, uh, sounds like I have a lisp, Um, in Hertfordshire of England. He's 1.74 meters tall and 67 kilograms. That's how they... Talk in Euro, talk there. And his favorite music, hip-hop, R&B, reggae, and funky house. Sounds good stuff to me. And for his hobbies, Lewis likes to listen to music, play guitar, read books, go to the gym, cycle, squash, tennis, chillin', and partying. <laughs> um, all around young guy there. Now, his career started in 1993 when he was 8 years old. And by the age of 10, Lewis had won his first British Kart Championship. A further four British Kart Championship followed from 96 to 97. And then at age 13 is when he was spotted uh, by Ron Dennis, and he signed a long-term contract at that time, guaranteeing financial and technical support and including a future option for entry into Formula One. How exciting for being 13 years old. He remains the only teenager ever to be signed by a Formula team at such an early age. And then further on his career, um, from the years 98 to 2000, Lewis had the financial backing secured by McLaren, and he won European and world karting titles, and he was crowned karting world number one in the year 2000. And this was at the age of 15. Four years later, Lewis remains the youngest ever world karting number one. So following his successful karting career, then Lewis graduated single-seater racing in 2002, and this was in the Formula Renault single-seater category, and he finished third in his first full season of car racing, already showing talent there as well. He did a second season of Formula Renault in 2003, and he then dominated the series. He set a championship record with 10 wins, 9 fastest slaps, 11 pole positions, 
and won the championship two rounds before the final race was even done. So just blown it away there. Then in 2004, he went over to the more and more competitive Formula 3 Euro Series, and uh, he won that championship, which tours around with the Germany DTM touring cars. And then he raced for Manor Motorsport, which was a rookie team in Europe. And this is also Lewis's rookie year for F3. And he finished fifth, but his um, overall in the championship. But he also had a win and four other podium positions at that time. That's pretty dang good. And then uh, in 2005, he w- he won the Formula 3 Euro Series championship. You can just see everything he does goes up, up, up. And uh, he was racing for, this time, the dominant ASM team. 2006, he joined the ART Grand Prix team for GP2 Series now. And he replaced, now, does ART, you know, T sound familiar to anybody? Well, that was Nico Rosberg's team. So when Nico got bumped up to F1, young Lewis Hamilton went in to replace Nico Rosberg. And in the GP2 Series, he has been impressive as well. At the European GP2 event, he won both races, becoming only the second driver to do so in the series history. The other one was Nico Rosberg. And he also won at Monaco from pole. I mean, how many of us would love to say that? Awesome. And at Silverstone that year, he he went one better, and he scored his first double race win, becoming the only driver in GP2 history to do so. And now he's, you know, he's the current 2006 GP2 championship. So he is pretty darn good now. Norberg Haug, <laughs> who Nasser was talking about dancing, doing a dance in his leader holes, and perhaps if, if Lewis Hamilton wins. But here's what Norberg Hau, the vice president of Mercedes-Benz Motorsport, comments about Lewis Hamilton. He says, Lewis is a gifted driver who proved his talent with two consecutive title wins, 2005 in Formula 3 Euro Series in a Dallara Mercedes, and this year in the GP2 Series. McLaren and Mercedes-Benz have supported Lewis already for nine years. He was half, half as tall as he is today when he started in karting. It's clear that Lewis has less experience in comparison to the other 21 Formula 1 drivers. Well, yeah, maybe. But um, he's, he's done extensive testing. He said he's very glad that a guy like him gets his deserved chance. So our great already words from Norberg Haug. And um, so I want to get some, some quotes from Young Lewis Hamilton, in his own words, when people were interviewing him, um, starting off with a question to Lewis, saying, your father, Anthony, must be very proud of you today. How much do you owe him? Lewis says, not only do I owe everything to my dad, but also to the rest of my family, my stepmom, Linda, and my younger brother, Nicholas, who is an inspiration not only to me, but to also to young kids everywhere. My family have had to sacrifice a lot and sacrifice their whole life since I was born. And they, they wanted to bring him up well and raise him well. He had, they have had to jump in and out of jobs, he says, to try and make as much money as possible to keep me going. It's been a long, hard struggle, and without their support, I wouldn't be here today. I believe um, his father was from Granada originally, so now he's in England, and young Lewis is considered a Brit, so that his family uh, moved over to try to move on up. Now, another question they say to Lewis, what are your ambitions for the year? He said, in the first year, it's going to be extremely tough especially being alongside Fernando Alonso. But I am still young, and I'm here to learn. I am dedicated to doing the best job I can. I'll be working as hard as possible off and on the track to get up to speed. And they then asked him, can you remember exactly when Ron Dennis told you, and how ready do you feel to move up to F1? He said, as soon as I finished the GP2 series, I went to the first test at Silverstone, and I already felt ready to make the next step. I knew it would take some time, you know, in the seat to get used to the controls and working with new people, but... It was Saturday, the 30th of September, just before the Chinese Grand Prix. He was invited to Ron Dennis' house, and he sat down with Ron and Martin Whitmarsh, who's the CEO of McLaren. I can't imagine sitting with those big boys on the couch there. He said, it was an incredible moment in my life. We sat there, and he said, we have decided you are going to be our driver next year. He said, "I, I put a professional front on and only had a small smile on me, but inside was overwhelming. (laughs) And so they asked him what a lot of people have been wondering, you know, do you have any reservations about going up against a driver like Fernando Alonso? And would you have been preferred to be with a teammate, someone slower and without much success? He said, having the best driver alongside me is going to be the best position for me. Having a two-time world champion who is also very experienced and very talented and a few years older than me is great. He can give a lot to the team, and I'll be you know, able to learn from him. I'm looking forward to the challenge. He's ready for it and looking forward to his first race. So he has a good attitude. And so they asked him, how early on your career did you feel you would be successful like this? Or how did you know you'd make it into F1? He says, it's a difficult question to answer. Every individual has to have a certain amount of confidence in themselves. 
After every year, you analyze how well you have done. What is the next step? How far do you think you can go? Deep in your heart, you know you have to know you have it and what, that you have what it takes. Did I feel I was confident you know, enough to get into F1? I started thinking that maybe when I was about 15, and he started to mature, he felt, and win international championships, he realized he had actual talent. And um, he says a lot of top F1 drivers have come through the top the route like me and won championships. And um, here's a good question. They say, what are the differences between an F1 car and a GP2 car? Lewis says, there's quite a big difference, although a lot of drivers say it's quite similar. The driving style is very, very similar, although in GP2, you don't have traction control. You have to control the car a lot more. In F1, you have to use the electronics a lot more to help you and to get the car on the limit. Driving the car around and doing reasonably time, you know, reasonable times is not a problem, but getting the car on the edge is tougher and way beyond anything I've driven in the past. So I need to make sure I'm mentally prepared and ready to understand everything that goes on over a GP weekend. I need to understand that the car as much as Fernando does. Sitting, I need to understand how to set it up and get it on its edge. That'll be the main challenge. So they say there's no pressure on you to be a, a trailblazer Oh, for being the first of mixed race. I guess he's of mixed race, but he says he doesn't feel the weight on his shoulders. He's proud of who he, who he is and where he comes from. He says getting there, you know, he just wants to be like other ethnic groups can see that everyone can do. They have the same open doors a chance. So when he's growing up, you know, you didn't have anyone that you could relate to that was like the same kind of blend as he is. But he says, you know, there's people that can relate to you on all different levels. He's just been trying to be a dedicated. And he says, what is your best quality, um, Lewis? What do you think is your best quality as a driver? He said, I think as a driver, there are many qualities that I have. You have a lot of drivers. Some are quick at qualifying, some testing over one lap. I find my main strength is in a race. Oh, I love it. I'm able to stay focused and never give up, which is key to succeeding in a race, no matter what position you are in. Awesome. Then he says, so you fight until the end. That is one of the key things I have. But I think also working with the team, being able to extract the most from the car and also from the team are some qualities. And he says, it's, I think it's key also, and you cannot win the race without the team. So he has a, he has a you know, never give up attitude, which Michael Schumacher also possessed that same quality. So, and he sounds pretty mature. Oh, they go ask him, do you have any special emotional feelings having for Ron Dennis and McLaren, and Ron Dennis still speaks fondly of you about the time he first met you at the Autosport Awards. He says, there are going to be emotions all over the place at the first race. It'll be a special moment in my career and the most important moment of my career so far. I've been racing for 13 years now, nine of those with McLaren. I've also known Ron for 11 years, and um, he says it's the new era now. And someone asked him, are there any worries that people will look at your color rather than your racing skills? He says, no, not really. I really don't look far into that. I'm here to do a job and here to do something I've wanted to do for many years. I will get on with my job and let other people get on with theirs. So exactly. It's a non-topic. It's a non-problem. I love that. So they go. They ask him, what do you think is a realistic ambition for you, Lewis? Ron has talked about you winning a race next season if the car is competitive enough, but only in the second half of the year. He says, I think it is fair to say that McLaren are in it to win. I'm certain that they're going to have a car that's capable of running in the top three next year. I think with Alonso's input, the car is going to be good next year, and we'll all be surprised. He says, I just have to take it slow, take my time, enjoy the moment, and learn as much as I can from Alonso. But I think a target, I would like to say, um, like any other driver, is to win. You cannot say the target is to, to finish in 10th. I race to win, so my target is to win a race at some point. Whether that is next season or the year after, I cannot say. Fingers crossed, I'll be able to get in some good points for the team anyway. And if he... Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, like he can show that he is upward, upward, upward every time he goes next season, next season. So, you know, he could do it. Um, he has a really good record here. And so they ask him, uh, what's the hardest thing for you to cope with? There'll be a lot of media interest and hype around you at the start of the season. He said, I think on the media side of it, I will be okay personally. Only because with the press I've had in GP2, I've been able to control it very well. And McLaren will be able to help me uh, on that side. He says, I think again, it'll be a question of getting used to different environments. The fame will be the hardest thing to get used to, but I'll always try to keep my feet on the ground and do the same job I always have. All right. You know, the other press is that they're saying he's a Brit, and now there are going to be four British drivers next year for the season. So that's, that's been, it's been a while since that's happened. In-house fighting or competitiveness between the British drivers, and people are quote, you know, commenting on that and what they think about it. You know, Honda's Jensen Button is the Brit and but he doesn't he doesn't appear appear phased with this another young British guy coming up referring to Hamilton here's what Jensen Button says 
He says, we are here to work, we're not here to, and we're here to be each other, we're not here to make friends. But as has been mentioned already, David Coulthard has been questioning, putting him again with world champion Alonso. He says that it could destroy Hamilton's confidence. He would be better off with a year's testing. Um, now, Damon Hill, former champion, said that, that there's going to be a rivalry from the start between Button and Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's because, you know, Ron Dennis said that that with the exception of Fernando and Kimi Raikkonen, no existing F1 driver was qualified to secure the second seat of the walking team. So he's already, like, saying no one else was good enough, and here I got my Lewis Hamilton. And he says that the other people have plateaued in their careers, and there was no one that's shown. Now he's already started his testing with the other guys. He's already done a couple days or two, three days of testing in Barcelona, and he's he's showing significant improvement from one day to the next. He was a half a second quicker, which counts in Formula One, and he's you know had some technical stuff here and there, but he's still keeping his cool. He says there's he's you know he's no you know pressure on him, no pressure to win. The pressure is going to come from himself, like they say. The pressure comes with the sport. It's part of the environment, and I will get used to it. He says, this is the pinnacle of motorsport. I, if you go into it and straight to the top, everyone will be able to do it. I'm 21, so I know there's a, a way to go, and I need to take it step by step. Team know I'm young, and that'll take some time for me to get up to speed and learn. I'm young, fresh, and extremely dedicated to do well in this sport. I want to win, so we will both be pushing hard to ex- achieve great success for ourselves and for the team. So that's, I think, my closing comment. That's He's young, fresh, and extremely dedicated. And I'm looking forward to seeing what this youngster has. He has his career has been shining so far. Hopefully, McLaren, Mercedes, please, 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 they will be able to turn it around and give Fernando Alonso a car that he deserves, being a two-time world champion. And we will all see. I still don't know who I'm going to root for next year. My loyalties are torn with Kimi going over to the red team and stuff. So, but um, so there, listeners, there's a little background on young Lewis Carl Hamilton. Like, like the drivers, I can't wait for the season to start, even though there's still a ways to go. So, everybody, listeners, thank you. Make sure you email me. And I want to say we're going to take a quick break now, and we'll be back after these messages. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Coulthard, uh, otherwise known as DC, and you're listening to F1 Weekly. Welcome back to F1Weekly.com. Clark Rogers here, your host, in now as we spin the globe and go around the world with Motorsports Mondial from the king the Sultan himself, Nasser Hamid. Thank you, sir, and hate to start the MM with some sad news. Wilson Fittipaldi has passed away. Of course, older brother of Emerson Fittipaldi and father of Christian Fittipaldi, he passed away last week. You know, um, remember around Christmas time, he had choked on a piece of chicken and uh, was taken to hospital. I thought he was recovering, but I read that he had been in coma since then. So that's very uh, sad to hear. Uh, Wilson had a brief career in Formula One as a driver, then set up his own team operating out of Interlagos and sponsored by Brazilian sugar cooperative Copa Sucar, and that's what the team was named after. Uh, despite funding and ammo driving for the team, it was not a sweet success. Um, and at one time, um, Joe Ramirez worked for um, Copa Sucar team in Brazil. I met uh, Mr. Fittipaldi, Wilson Fittipaldi, that is, some years ago at Daytona when his uh, son Christian was racing there. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Rogers, as we grow older, more and more racing personalities from our younger days are departing on a regular basis. Our condolences to the Fittipaldi family and friends. Anything you would like to add, sir? Yes, it happens. We're all getting older. I remember the choking on the chicken, and I did not realize that he had succumbed to that specific injury. It just took a long time, but condolences to all. And we move on. Okay, Binotto back in business. Mattia Binotto, the ex-Ferrari engineer. There was a lot of talk. He may go to Alpine and he may go to Audi. And this just goes to show you really cannot depend on information repeated again and again on the media unless it's confirmed by the parties in war. Okay, so he has now joined a company totally out of Formula One in Italy called Texa, T-E-X-A, and they want to become a leading manufacturer and supplier of components for an electrified vehicle with Binotto at the helm. And they're apparently doing pretty good right now. So that's one F1 personality who has now left the paddock at least for the time being. 
nothing is forever, as they say. Anything else going on in racing world, sir, that you would like to talk about? How is your NASCAR passion going? My NASCAR passion, I always keep an open mind every weekend. And I see it, I put it on, I attempt to get through one stage, perhaps. But Atlanta, it's a short track. I mean, it seemed like a short track. 300 laps, I'm not even sure. But it just gets lost. I begin to understand how exciting the caution and the tire fire is. And your uh, favorite racer, Danica Patrick, is getting some flack uh, for her comment on the new Drive to Survive, I believe, which I have not seen yet. I have not seen it either, and I heard something about something about Danica. But hey, you know, we don't want to, we can't be mean or un-PC towards the lady. I think she's doing a fine job. Keep up the good work. Now, as the race, I'm sure you know, is on a Saturday, the season opener. Uh, what time is your local time when the race is on, if I may ask? You know, I haven't even checked. I just made sure that my recorder was recording, but I forgot to look. But it's it's early morning because I think they're starting late at night. It's a night race, and everybody likes night races. And I think they do this so the Europeans don't suffer when they wake up in the morning with their cup of joe. Yeah, make sure you set your VCR or whatever technology you have for Saturday morning because if you set up for Sunday morning, you're going to get Game Day America or Major League Baseball from, you know, Pago Pago. And there's nothing wrong with baseball from Pago Pago, of course. Would you prefer that over Formula One? No, 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 but you're right. Now I'm paranoid. I will go check. But when I did check, everything was working well. My DVR was set to record Formula One. So when I looked, everything was on automatically recorded. So I do have to check the times, but hey, I'm flexible. Saturday morning works for me. I just will have to skip my cartoons. Yes, and you know, I will be traveling and the way it's working out, I think I am going to miss out on the first 30 minutes of the race. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. I'm sure somewhere they will be. I mean, I have I subscribed to the F1 TV thingy, F1 TV, so I can always uh, play dumb and ignorant and watch the replay as a live recording. But we'll, we'll see. I'm looking forward to the race, that's for sure. And of course, the Formula 2 season is also starting and they have a new car and there's a lot of hope spinning on Mr. Kimi Antonelli, who is 17 years old and Toto has made him skip Formula 3 and he wants him to be the Italian Max Verstappen skip F3 and come into Formula 1 very quickly. I hope it works out. The interesting part is, I think we discussed last week also, his teammate is also a very talented English chap, um, Oli Behrman. So it's going to be very, very good. And then there is your French homeboy, Victor Martins, or Martin, uh, who is, I think, the preseason favorite because he is in second season of Formula 2. So there's a lot riding on this weekend. I am looking forward to it, sir. The pressure on Kimi... To win the F2 championship is pretty big. Toto has set the bar pretty high for this young man. And to have a teammate like Behrman and, like you said, Martin is raring to go. And everybody's getting used to the new car, even though they did some testing. And I like the new car. It looks well. So it's going to be an exciting F2 season for sure. And, sir, I will be out of the country. So, unfortunately, I will miss the race, which I enjoy very much. And that's the IndyCar season opener in St. Petersburg. I forgot all about that, Nass. You always attend that race. So, hmm. I'm going to miss that, and I'm going to miss the Sebring round also. But I am planning a lot of stuff, Mr. Rogers, in terms of attending races. I have to do something to stay alive. Okay, sir. Shall we proceed to famous last words from Bill Buxton? Give it all you got, Nasser. Yes, sir. Will Buxton, he's a very nice guy. I've met him many times at races, and he's very well known as a announcer and commentator. And he was talking about Haas F1. This is what he said, and I quote, Haas are in a really difficult spot. It's not bringing a knife to a gunfight. They're bringing a spoon, end quote. And Mr. Rogers, as they say in a song, and she drove herself to madness with a silver spoon. Let's see what kind of spoon Mr. Haas and Komatsu san bring to the table. And Silver Spoon brings us to this week's Musical Mondial. Here's Mr. Don Henley, 
Thank you for listening, and please enjoy. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Hi, I'm Nick Heidfeld, and you're listening to F1 Weekly.